I had always been a huge fan of Halloween. It was the one time of the year when my parents really went all out, turning our house into something that looked straight out of a horror show. Each year, we'd pick a new theme. Sometimes it was a haunted mansion, other times a spooky graveyard. We went all in, fake gravestones on the lawn, spider webs draped everywhere, and a fog machine that turned our yard into a misty scene right out of a ghost story. Our front porch became the center of all the eerie action, with life-size skeletons and moving monsters to match the theme of the year. But the costumes? Those were the real highlight. My parents were amazing at putting them together, and we never missed out on winning the informal neighborhood contest for the best-dressed family. For us, Halloween was practically a sacred event. But the Halloween when I was in middle school was a little different. That year, my parents decided to give me more freedom since I was getting older. This time, I got to pick my own costume, something a little darker than my usual pirate or superhero getup. I went all in as a zombie, complete with full makeup and ripped up clothes. My friends and I had been hyping it up for weeks, planning to cause some harmless chaos and hit up every house for candy. The goal? To see who could haul in the most by the end of the night. We knew it was going to be epic. The night started as you might expect. My friends and I wandering the neighborhood, laughing, shouting, and daring each other to knock on the scariest houses we could find. We filled our bags with candy and even managed a few harmless pranks. Nothing serious, just enough to keep things exciting. By the time I got home, it was around 10 p.m. My legs were aching from all the walking. When I stepped through the door, I was surprised. My parents were still up, which wasn't too strange. They liked to spend time together, even on Halloween. But what caught me off guard was that they had set up the living room for a late night movie marathon. And not just any movie, it was the Amityville Horror. I'd been asking to watch it for years, but they always said no because they thought it was too scary, that it would give me nightmares. But I guess being in middle school came with some perks. How about it? My dad asked, grinning from the couch. Yeah, sure, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. Honestly, I was kind of nervous. Sure, I liked horror movies, but the Amityville horror was on another level. I'd heard stories about the opening scene where the father kills his whole family. Just thinking about it sent chills down my spine, but I wasn't going to back out now. I flopped onto the couch, still in my zombie costume, my pillowcase full of candy beside me. The lights were low, and the living room was lit only by the flickering light of the TV as the movie started. My dad settled into his chair, and my mom sat beside him with a blanket draped over her. As the opening credits rolled, I popped a piece of candy into my mouth, feeling my heart pound in my chest. The movie wasted no time getting under my skin. The slow, deliberate pace, the creepy sounds of the old house in the film, and the way the father slowly lost his mind. It all felt disturbingly real. When the scene came where he brutally murders his family, I couldn't help but flinch. I wasn't going to admit it, but I was scared. About halfway through the movie, my dad started to doze off in his chair. He mumbled something about heading to bed, then shuffled down the hall to the bedroom, leaving just me and my mom to finish watching. I watched him go, suddenly feeling a little more exposed. It was silly, I knew it was just a movie, but there was something unsettling about watching it in the dark. Just the two of us. The house felt too quiet. We kept watching, but my mind was drifting. The movie was fading into the background as I started to notice how dark the shadows outside looked, how the wind was making the porch swing creak. I shifted in my seat, trying to shake off the unease settling in my gut. Then I saw something. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light, maybe a reflection or some decoration my parents had put up on the porch. But the longer I stared, the more I realized that wasn't the case. There was definitely a shadow out there, faint but unmistakable, standing just outside the front door. My breath caught in my throat as I leaned forward, squinting through the window. It was the shape of a person. For a second, 
I thought about ignoring it, convincing myself it was just my imagination. But the figure didn't move. It just stood there, motionless, right by the door, as if waiting for something. Mom, I whispered, my voice tight with fear. There's someone outside. My mom turned, frowning, and followed my gaze to the window. She stood up slowly, her face paling as she spotted the figure. Get away from the window, she whispered, her voice low and urgent. Then she bolted down the hall, calling for my dad. I stayed frozen on the couch, my heart pounding in my ears. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the window. The figure was still there, barely visible, but enough to send chills down my spine. As I watched, the shadow shifted, stepping into the dim light of the porch, and that's when I saw it was a woman. She wasn't wearing a costume like I had thought. No, she was an older lady, her hair wild and frizzy, her face sunken and lined with deep wrinkles. She wore a torn nightgown, and in her hand, she held a large kitchen knife, the blade glinting in the faint light. Before I could even process what was happening, my dad rushed back into the room, wearing nothing but a t-shirt and his boxers. He was gripping a shotgun tightly in his hands. He marched straight to the window, tapping the glass with the barrel of the gun. Get out of here, he ordered, his voice calm but thick with tension. The police are already on their way. The woman outside didn't move. Instead, she slowly turned her head and her eyes locked onto mine. For a second, I was certain she could see me through the window, like she knew I was watching her. That's when she started moving jerky, unnatural movements, as if she wasn't fully in control of her own body. She raised the knife she was holding and slammed it against the front door, over and over, her voice rising into wild screams. He's dead. He's dead. I don't know who killed him, but he's dead, she howled. The sound of the knife striking the door echoed through the house, each hit sending fresh waves of terror through me. My dad knocked on the window again, harder this time. I said get out of here, but she didn't stop. She kept stabbing the door, her motions becoming more erratic, her cries more desperate. He's dead. He's dead. I don't know who did it. I couldn't move. I couldn't even breathe. All I could do was sit there, paralyzed, watching this woman, this stranger, tear into our front door with a knife, her voice trembling with a madness I couldn't begin to understand. Then, as quickly as it had started, it stopped. The woman let out one final, guttural scream before turning and sprinting off into the night, vanishing into the shadows as fast as she had appeared. None of us moved for a few minutes. My dad stood by the window, still gripping the shotgun, his chest rising and falling with slow, controlled breaths. My mom came back into the room, her face pale and her eyes wide with shock. The only sound was the soft hum of the TV, still playing the horror movie, though everything that had just happened in real life made the movie seem insignificant. Finally, my dad broke the silence. Call the police, he said, his voice steady but strained. The next few hours passed in a blur. The police arrived quickly, I'll give them that. They took statements from my parents while I sat on the couch, still in my zombie costume, trying to wrap my head around what had just happened. The officers asked if we knew the woman, but we didn't. She was a total stranger, someone we had never seen before, someone who seemed to have just snapped. They found her later that night, on the edge of a neighbor's property, babbling incoherently about how everything was out to get her. They also found her husband inside their home, barely alive but still breathing, his body covered in stab wounds. They rushed him to the hospital, but we never found out what happened after that. There were rumors in the neighborhood, of course, that she had gone mad, that she was schizophrenic and had been off her meds for weeks. A few other neighbors had even found dead pets nearby, mutilated. If she was behind that too, she must have truly lost her grip on reality. That night changed everything for me. Halloween was never the same after that.
Sure, we still decorated the house and handed out candy, but for me, it wasn't the same. Halloween used to be this fun, carefree time where I could get lost in the excitement. But after that night, the magic disappeared. It was replaced by a knot of unease in my stomach that never really went away. For a while, I didn't even want to talk about it. I kept telling myself it was just a freak event, a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But at night, when the house was dark and quiet, I couldn't help but replay the scene in my head. The wild look in that woman's eyes, the way she gripped the knife like it was her lifeline. The sound of her screams haunted me, echoing in my ears long after she had disappeared into the night. The worst part was the helplessness. I had been just a few feet away from the door, and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't stop her, couldn't protect my family. I just sat there watching as the stranger, a woman I had never seen before, fell apart on our doorstep. I'd never felt so vulnerable in my life. The police followed up with us a few days later. They told us that the woman had been living just down the street from us for years, though I couldn't remember ever seeing her. Apparently, her mental health had been rapidly declining in the weeks leading up to that night. She had been on medication, but her paranoia had taken over. She genuinely believed everyone was trying to kill her. When she finally snapped, she turned on her husband. Thankfully, he survived, but just barely. By the time the police found her, she was completely disconnected from reality, ranting about demons and conspiracies. They didn't tell us what happened to her after that, but I assume she was taken to some sort of facility where she couldn't hurt anyone else or herself. Part of me felt bad for her. What kind of nightmare must she have been living in to do something like that? But another part of me couldn't shake the fear. What if she hadn't run off? What if she had broken down the door? What if I had been standing on the other side of the glass when she swung that knife? I tried to push the memory away, to forget about it, but every Halloween after that, I found myself looking over my shoulder, listening for the creak of the porch swing, watching the shadows outside the windows. My parents tried to keep things normal, decorations, costumes, the usual, but even they seemed more cautious. My dad installed better locks on the doors, added a security system, and kept that shotgun even closer. We never really talked about that night. It was like this silent agreement between us. We all knew what happened, but none of us wanted to admit how close we had come to something far worse. Now, I sometimes wonder how much of what we see in horror movies like the Amityville Horror with ghosts and demonic forces are just reflections of the real horrors that exist in our world every day. The kind you never expect to see, the kind that knock on your door on a quiet Halloween night and change your life forever. Growing up, holidays were always a big event for my family. It wasn't about the gifts or the food, but more about the tradition itself. Everyone gathering from far and wide and feeling like part of something bigger than just our little family. My mom and dad would pack up my brother, Jake, and me into the car, and we'd drive about 30 minutes to my grandparents' house in a small quiet town. We had the same routine every year, starting with Halloween. That first trip of the season always felt special, marking the start of a long chain of celebrations. Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, with New Year's being the grand finale. But by then, the magic had worn off a bit, and we were all ready for a break from the chaos. Grandma and Grandpa lived in a large, creaky old house at the end of their street, an old Victorian place with peeling paint and overgrown bushes, like something straight out of a ghost story. Just a few doors down was Aunt Susan's house, smaller but newer, with well-kept flower beds. That's where my cousin Lucy lived with her little brother, Jack. Whenever we visited, it wasn't just family time, Lucy, Jake, and I would get into all sorts of mischief with the local kids. Trick or treating was a given, but it was the moments in between, the time before and after, that really stuck with me over the years. But there was always a bit of tension during those visits. A woman named Marla lived in the house between my grandparents and Aunt Susan's. 
If you could even call it a house, it was more like a dilapidated shack that looked worse every year. My parents and grandparents always said the same thing. Stay away from Marla's place. Don't even go near her yard. It wasn't hard to follow that rule because there was just something about her that gave you chills. Marla was tall, probably over six feet, and built like she could move boulders. She always wore the same denim overalls and flannel shirts, her broad shoulders stretching the fabric. Around her neck hung a necklace made of bones, which I never wanted to examine too closely. She stomped around in heavy work boots, always in the middle of some strange task. Her yard was surrounded by a rusted wire fence, and inside, it was a chaotic mess of stray animals. Cats, dogs, all of them looking as wild as the property itself. We'd hear her shouting at them, her voice echoing down the street as she scrubbed her house with a giant sponge or tended her strange garden. That Halloween was colder than usual. The sky was a deep purple by the time we put on our costumes, and the chill in the air made everything feel sharper, more alive. Lucy, Jake, and I met up with two other kids from the neighborhood, Greg and Emma, and set off to gather as much candy as we could carry. It was the usual trick-or-treating routine. Knock on doors, yell trick or treat, grab candy, and run to the next house. By the time we made it through most of the neighborhood, our pillowcases were heavy with sweets, and we were feeling bold, almost invincible in that sugar-fueled way kids do. That's when Greg got the idea. What if we go to Marla's house? He said, his eyes gleaming with mischief and peer pressure. We all froze, staring at the dark, crumbling shape of her place just a few yards away. Her windows were dark, and her yard was quiet. It was the only house without decorations, no pumpkins, no fake cobwebs. No way, Lucy said, shaking her head. My mom will kill me. Come on, Greg urged, dropping his voice like he was sharing some secret. It's Halloween. What's the worst that could happen? She'll probably just try to scare us. Jake, always the cautious one, shook his head. We're not supposed to go near her house. Dad said so but I was feeling that same rush as Greg. This was our chance to prove we weren't afraid of her, that the stories were just stories. Let's just knock, I said, the words escaping before I could stop them. What's the worst thing that could happen? So that's what we did. The five of us crept up to her porch, our footsteps ridiculously loud on the cracked stone path. Up close, the house looked even worse, the wood swollen and splintering, the roof sagging in the middle. There was no doorbell, just a weathered door that looked like it hadn't been opened in years. Greg was the first to knock, a quick, sharp rap that echoed in the stillness of the night. Nothing happened. We shuffled, glancing at each other nervously. Greg knocked again harder, still nothing. For a second, I thought we were in the clear that maybe she wasn't home. But then we heard it, a faint shuffling sound, like something being dragged across the floor, followed by a series of thuds. We all froze. The shuffling grew louder, more frantic. Then there was a loud crash and a low, eerie moan that made my stomach flip. What was that? Lucy whispered, her voice trembling. Before we could react, the door creaked open, just a crack at first, then wider until a dim flickering light spilled onto the porch. It was coming from somewhere deep inside the house, casting long shadows. At first, I couldn't see much, just something moving in the darkness. And then slowly it appeared. At first, I thought it was a mask, a grotesque mask with sagging skin and hollow eyes, hanging from a mop of tangled hair. But then I saw the hand holding it up, a gnarled, weathered hand gripping the scalp. It was a head, a human head. Its mouth hung open, eyes dull and lifeless. Marla stepped into view, her massive frame filling the doorway. She shook the head back and forth like a puppet. Oh dear. She crooned in a sing-song voice, making the head bob. You've made a terrible, terrible mistake. I couldn't move. 
My legs were frozen in place as her voice shifted, growing darker, harsher. I can't wait for you all to spend the night in hell. That was it. Something snapped in me, and before I knew it, I was sprinting down the street, the others close behind. We didn't stop until we were back at my grandparents' house, breathless and terrified, trying to explain what had happened. Of course, no one believed us. Grandma just smiled and said she was trying to scare us. But the head, it was real. The blood dripping from it, the smell, it wasn't a Halloween prop. We never went near Marla's house again. But a few months later, Aunt Susan had an encounter that proved we hadn't imagined at all. I've always enjoyed babysitting, especially for the Mallory family. Their home was modern and stylish, unlike my family's old, creaky house where the wind outside sounded like something trying to break in. No, the Mallory house had thick, heavy doors, spotless white walls, and top-of-the-line security cameras in every corner. It always felt safe there. Plus, their two kids, Logan and Sophie, were easy to look after. Logan, who was five, was quiet for his age, with large, thoughtful eyes. Sophie, at three, was bubbly and constantly looking for attention, as though she'd never been ignored in her life. I'd babysat for them countless times before, so when Mrs. Mallory asked me to work on Halloween and offered double pay, I didn't hesitate. At first, I was going to decline. I had plans with my friends to attend a party, but when she mentioned double pay, I reconsidered. The extra money could cover some things I'd been eyeing online, and it was only Halloween. How bad could it be? When I arrived, the air had a sharp chill, and the neighborhood was alive with kids in costumes, running from door to door, bags outstretched for candy. The Malaris home looked festive as usual, with pumpkins on the porch, a few fake cobwebs in the bushes, and a plastic skeleton hanging from a tree in the front yard. The kids were already hyped up in their superhero costumes. Logan dressed as Batman and Sophie in a sparkly, pink fairy outfit, complete with wings. Just keep an eye on them and don't let them eat too much candy, Mr. Mallory said with a grin, adjusting his pirate costume before heading out with his wife. They were off to a big Halloween party downtown and wouldn't be back until late. We'll call to check in, Mrs. Mallory added, blowing kisses to the kids before they disappeared into the night. It was just me, Logan, Sophie, and a massive bowl of candy. We spent the early part of the evening trick-or-treating in the neighborhood. The kids were thrilled, racing from house to house, shouting trick-or-treat at the top of their lungs. Every few minutes, I had to remind them not to run too far ahead and to slow down on the candy consumption. It was fun but exhausting. During our walk, I noticed a man who wasn't in costume. He wore an old, tattered coat and jeans. There was something about the way he moved that made me uneasy. He lingered at the edge of the sidewalk watching the kids. I tried to shrug it off. There were plenty of parents around. Maybe he was waiting for his kids but he didn't seem to have any children with him. That and the scowl on his face raised a red flag for me. When we returned to the Mallory house, something felt off. That man had gotten into my head and the fact that he vanished after a few sightings creeped me out. The first weird incident happened when we were handing out candy. The kids and I were watching a Halloween movie, sitting near the front door with a bowl of candy ready for the next group of trick-or-treaters. There was a knock, harder than the others, almost impatient, like someone was pounding on the door with their fist. I opened it, expecting a group of kids, but it was him, the same man from earlier. His hair was greasy, and his eyes were wild, like he hadn't slept in days. He stood there, breathing heavily, staring at me. No kids, no costume. Can I help you? I asked, gripping the door frame. He muttered something too quiet to hear. What? I asked again, ready to shut the door. He mumbled once more, 
then turned and walked away, vanishing into the night. I slammed the door, locked it, and turned the deadbolt. It didn't make me feel any safer, though. The house suddenly felt colder, darker. A few moments later, there was another knock, this time from the back door. My stomach dropped. The backyard wasn't a place trick-or-treaters went, and I hadn't heard anyone move around the house. I grabbed my phone and cautiously approached the kitchen, where the back door was. The knocks were steady, like someone wanted me to know they were there. I peeked through the blinds, nothing, no one. I locked the back door and backed away, my nerves on edge. I called Mrs. Mallory, my hands shaking. She answered cheerfully, the sounds of a party in the background. I explained the situation, and she casually brushed it off, suggesting it was just kids playing pranks. We'll be home in an hour, she said. An hour felt like forever. I hung up and tried to relax, but soon, the knock started again, louder, more forceful. I rushed upstairs to check on Logan and Sophie. They were fine, giggling at the TV, oblivious to what was happening. I told them it was time for bed, but they begged to stay up a little longer. I agreed, but only if they stayed in their room. Back downstairs, I paced, checking the clock every few minutes. Then, there was another knock softer this time. I peeked through the curtains. It was just Mr. Davis from next door with his kids. Relief flooded me as I opened the door. Trick or treat, he said, handing out candy to his children. But as he lingered, he looked at the house, puzzled. Strange seeing you here, he said. We passed by earlier and saw Mr. Mallory in his office. My heart skipped a beat. What? Mr. Mallory isn't home. He and Mrs. Mallory are at a party. His smile faded. Are you sure? I'm positive I saw someone standing in the office window. Just then, we heard a creak from upstairs. The unmistakable sound of someone moving around. There's someone upstairs, I whispered. Mr. Davis's eyes widened. Get the kids out. Now, he said, pulling out his phone to call the police. He rushed into the house before I could stop him. I grabbed the kids and rushed them outside, joining Mr. Davis's kids as we huddled in the front yard. Within minutes, the police arrived. They entered the house and found the man, the same one from earlier, hiding in the parents' bedroom closet, clutching some of Mrs. Mallory's belongings. He had been inside the house for at least 35 minutes, watching us. The Mallorys were horrified but they downplayed the incident, calling it a close call. But I knew better. If it hadn't been for Mr. Davis, things could have ended much worse. I stopped babysitting after that.